Uh, good morning. I'm Adrian Dix, BC's Minister of Health. Beside me is Dr. Bonnie Henry, uh, BC's Provincial Health Officer. Uh, we're honored to be here on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, to start, I wanted to present the schedule for the week. Today, obviously, we're at uh, 10 a.m. on Monday. From Tuesday to Friday, we'll be at th the briefings will be at 3 p.m. Uh, they'll all be taking place here in Victoria at the Press Gallery Theatre. Uh, to our broadcasters who created a pool video system that uh, reduces the number of cameras in the room, we thank you for doing that. And for smaller outlets who are unable to join the pool, a reminder that you can stream video of our news conferences in real time on the BC government Facebook and Twitter feed. So that information, that vid video is available to you. Um, on uh, Monday, on ch today and tomorrow, uh, Dr. Henry and I will be briefing. On Wednesday and Thursday, it'll be just Dr. Henry, and on Friday, it will be the two of us again. We are, as you can, would expect, especially for Dr. Henry, trying to reduce uh, travel in our own circumstances and to only do absolutely necessary travel. So that's uh, what the briefing schedule will look like this week. In addition, there will likely be a special briefing session which will involve um, a, a background and a pre-briefing on specifics involving modeling, which we will, uh, which uh, modeling of, uh, of COVID-19, which we'll inform you of in due course. And with that, uh, for today's briefing, I want to introduce Dr. Henry. Thank you and good morning. Um, so for today, uh, we have a number of new cases. We're reporting on uh, the cases that have tested positive since our last briefing on Saturday morning. Um, the number of new cases is 48, uh, giving us a total number of test positive cases of 472 here in British Columbia. Of those, 248 are in Vancouver Coastal Health, 150 in Fraser Health, 39 on Vancouver Island, 30 in Interior Health Region, and 5 in Northern Health Region. Um, of those, 33 people are currently hospitalized, and 14 of those in hospital are in the intensive care unit. In addition, we've had three additional deaths over the last two days. One, uh, a resident of the Lynn Valley Care Center, one, a resident of uh, Harrow Park, unfortunately, and another uh, a community dwelling resident in, in the Fraser Health region. So uh, we're very saddened, of course, um, by the passing of these people. On a more positive note, we have finally got enough testing and uh, symptom resolution back to, to be able to say we now have 100 people who have been uh, considered recovered and released from isolation. So that is um, a really good thing to be able to put that on our books finally. Um, as I have mentioned, many of the people who have tested positive had been very, very mild illness and have been recovered for some time. So the criteria for being able to allow them to come out of isolation um, has finally been met for most of them now. In addition, uh, we have six now long-term care facilities that have been affected by COVID-19. The Lynn Valley Care Centre, we now have uh, 36 uh, residents and 19 healthcare workers who are affected there. Hollyburn is the same. Um, the Harrow Park uh, has increased um, by a few. We're now having uh, have 10 residents and 12 healthcare workers who have tested positive at that facility. Um, we the two new facilities are the German Canada House in Vancouver Coastal Health, where one staff person has been um, affected so far, and an outbreak response is ongoing at that facility and the Delta View Long-Term Care Centre in Fraser Health. Um, again, one staff person was identified as positive and a full outbreak response is happening at that facility as well. We have been working diligently in our lab system and uh, as, you, as we've talked about over the last week, it has been a challenge for the lab to keep up with the volume of testing, and uh, we've done over 18,000 tests, as you're aware, um, and the backlog of testing that had accumulated over the past week and a half 
is mostly resolved and we're hoping it will be completely resolved by the end of um, today or tomorrow. So that is great. We've also ramped up the capacity so that we're able to test as widely as we need to. We have changed our criteria for testing, as you know, to focus on healthcare workers, on long-term care, on clusters and cases in the community that are not linked to travel, um, where we recognize that for the large number of people who have traveled back to, to British Columbia from outside Canada, the self-isolation is what they need to do, even if they have mild symptoms and they do not need to have a test in those cases. We will be posting, of course, the testing numbers as well on a more regular basis um, as we uh, in the coming days. I also posted, I uh, presented some information about um, both the testing curve but also what we call the epidemic curve with the onset of illness on Saturday and that information will be updated on a daily basis and will be posted on the BC CDC website. I know there has been some concern expressed um, that you know, our change in our strategy for testing means that there's a bunch of cases that we're actually not getting to or that we're not recognizing in the community. And uh, while we do recognize um, that uh, people who have symptoms and they've had an exposure um, may have this disease, it doesn't mean that everybody needs to be tested. But we will be um, posting um, what we call epidemiologic linked cases as well. So if I'm in a family, for example, and one person in the family has tested positive and I develop similar symptoms and able to be managed at home, we don't necessarily need to test you, but we'll call you a case, an epidemically linked case. So we'll be posting that, that information as well as we um, get that information going in our, our, in our epidemiologic um, summaries. So that will give you a, a better sense of the numbers of people who have been affected by this disease here in BC. So there has been, as I'm sure everybody in this room is aware, monumental changes in the past week across British Columbia, across all of our communities, um, in trying to put in place measures to physically distance people and ensure we're doing everything we can to slow down and stop the transmission of this virus in our communities. And for the most part, despite what we've been seeing on social media and some of the concerns that are expressed, people are doing their part. But we cannot let up. And we do need to be sure that we're addressing some of those issues that we have seen with people congregating in groups and you know, often outside where it's very visible. So uh, I'm, again, um, ensuring that people that it is okay. If you are not in self-isolation, yes, you can go outside, but go only with your family members in small groups. Maintain those distances. It is important for us to keep our health and mental health going as well through this. And we also need to maintain essential services. And I know there's been some, um, I've been receiving reports that people are confused about what they need to do and how they need to do it. But it is incredibly important for us that all of us can manage this only by making sure that we have essential services going. So things like our grocery stores are essential, um, our, our banks, our pharmacies, but we need to have safe measures so that we can all get the food that we need, get the medications we need in a safe way. And I know many, many places are taking those measures and I'm really heartened by that. So we'll be working with them to make sure that we have those things in place to best protect everybody, but continue to be able to, to support each other and to work on and to ensure we have what we need to get through this next few weeks to months. I also want to talk about uh, um, the, the, the importance of doing these things to protect our healthcare workers and our healthcare system. As we know, healthcare workers are really the heart of our response to this pandemic, and they face risks both in the community and at work. So those community measures we are taking are incredibly important for protecting our nurses, our doctors, our care aides, the people who work in all of our healthcare facilities as well. 
In addition, as you, as you know, we have a number of long-term care homes that have been affected, and we know that people in long-term care are of the most vulnerable for having severe illness with COVID-19. So the, the health authorities, particularly here on the Lower Mainland that are most affected, will be implementing additional measures at long-term care. And I know that this will be a challenge for some people in our community because you will not be able to see your loved one as simply and as easily as we have in the past. And I know the long-term care homes are going out of their way to try and um, put in provisions to allow you to connect, even if you're not physically present. We also will be screening um, long-term care uh, workers um, as they come into work every day and providing clear guidance on the use of personal protective equipment to protect themselves, their colleagues, and our patients. I also am appealing to my colleagues in healthcare that we need to really have a heightened awareness of our symptoms. We've been saying from the very beginning that many people, especially young healthy people, which most of our healthcare workforce is, can have very mild symptoms. And we can pass it on to each other when we're in the break rooms, when we're working together on the ward, and we can pass it on to our patients. So we need to have a heightened awareness of even very mild symptoms and ensure we take the physical distancing measures that we need and are able to maintain um, our, our services in a safe way. And so um, I mentioned already that we shared the epidemiologic curve and more info information will come, but we still need to work together to flatten this curve. Every day that you and your family stay distance from others and follow the, the important things that we talked about from the very beginning of this, cleaning our hands regularly, covering our mouth when we cough, enhanced cleaning measures in our community and in our, in our homes. The more that we do this, the better prepared we will be for the coming days and coming weeks. And we must do everything possible every day to protect our communities and protect our loved ones. So thank you very much, Dr. Henry, and um, Dr. Henry noted that uh, we're announcing three more uh, deaths today. That uh, that brings a total of people who passed away as a result of COVID-19 to 13. And I just want to start by taking a, a moment to acknowledge this, acknowledge its impact, the lives they led, and the grief and pain felt by their loved ones. And, you know, every day at the briefing, uh, we report on numbers, but let's not lose sight of the truth that we're speaking about people. They're our neighbors, they're our friends, they're the people of our community, and on their behalf, and on behalf of those, uh, uh, of all of us in the community, we have to beat back this disease here in BC. We must do what needs to be done. We need to go in, all in, 100% for them and those we love. We need to fight the fight, and that's the fight we're doing now. I wanted to note, uh, as Dr. Henry has said, uh, 472 cases in total in British Columbia. That's uh, 248 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 150 in Fraser Health, uh, 39 on Vancouver Island, 30 in Interior Health, and five in the Northern Health Authority. Uh, Dr. Henry talked about the extraordinary work being done by all of our partners who are involved in testing. Uh, we've done in the last couple of days, each day, record numbers of tests. Um, so every week you'll have noted from February 28th to the present, we've essentially doubled uh, or more the number of testing, uh, the total number amount of testing we've done the previous week. That will happen again this week. Um, and uh, we're, at, I think, in the range of about 3,300 to 3,600 a day. Um, with respect to long-term care, I, I just uh, emphasize that the most important measures we're taking, the measures that have been taken by uh, health authorities uh, in the province and led by Dr. Henry are some of the most important measures we've taken. We know um, that the significant impact of, uh, of transmission in long-term care and those measures, those measures um, are some of the most important that we will, we have taken and will take. And I want to acknowledge in particular uh, the role of, uh, of our health care workers and those that represent them, the BCNU and the HEU, the Health Sciences Association, the BCGU, QP Local 873, the resident doctors of BC, the doctors of BC. The Health Hospital Employees Union has 
um, engaged with us and, uh, and others in, a, in an effort to put into place the orders of uh, Dr. Henry and her colleagues. And they involve a huge reorganization of the province. And I think that union has just done exceptional work uh, in doing that. It's been committed 100% both on the part of their members and on the part of their residents they serve. And uh, I'd like to recognize that today. I'd also like to note, just as an example of, of one amongst many that our healthcare workers have done, that 22 nurses, 22 volunteered to go in and assist at the Lynn Valley Care Home, which is um, an extraordinary thing. We've talked about acute care capacity. I just wanted to update you on, uh, on that acute care capacity. Uh, we've increased uh, by, uh, by um, activating surge capacity. We've increased the number of beds available in the system by 1,234. And so uh, in, uh, since March 20th, when I announced numbers about, uh, about uh, the availability of beds, uh, just to put it in context, um, in uh, the pre-COVID period this time of year, our bed capacity would be at 103.5%. It's currently across the system as of uh, uh, yesterday at 430 at 68.6%. There is a change in the available beds of 3,632 available. In addition, the critical care bed occupancy capacity, critical care beds, which have also increased in numbers in the last few days by 177. Uh, are at 55.7 percent, and this is an extraordinary um, change, I think, in in our system, and I think one that uh, one that we need to acknowledge because it is also a very significant challenge when you talk about the availability, essentially, uh, 300,632 beds, uh, uh, 3,632 beds, excuse me. Um, uh, available or empty. It means that hospitals, and I talked to people both working and in a hospital this weekend, are, are, uh, are feel empty, they feel quiet, and obviously they feel uh, as if they're anticipating something that's about to come. And so that, needless to say, is a source of anxiety. And I so admire the work of our acute care, uh, those working in acute care as well as in long-term care and in the community for the extraordinary work that they are doing. And I think uh, we all have to recognize that. We're going to continue uh, to identify ways to increase um, available capacity in acute care. Just as an example, um, designating the new summit at Quadra Village in Victoria as a hospital. So that, those, uh, that there's 320 beds there. The main purpose of that is to help move uh, residents, uh, people who are called ALC, patients or alternative level of care patients out of the hospital and into the care. So that will mean delaying uh, uh, for the moment the move of people from existing care homes to the summit at Quadra Village and the opening up of that space. So we'll be moving uh, and creating more, even more um, uh, space in Vancouver, in southern Vancouver Island uh, in acute care so that it's available to everybody. Finally, I want to say this. Uh, I want to just echo uh, Dr. Henry and first of all thank so many people in BC for the extraordinary changes in their lives that have taken place uh, really uh, in the last two weeks and many in, in an accelerated way in the last week. I think uh, people on the whole have been extraordinary. There's a lot of, been a lot of focus on, uh, on people outside, particularly on Saturday, at least uh, in my experience, and I've talked to a number of mayors today, uh, the experience of everyone, that had lessened considerably on Sunday and we continue to need to do that. The measures that we've taken in long-term care are of, of special importance in that regard and I just want to note and highlight them. And I want to say as well that, uh, that we have to engage in this fight at 100 percent and that means maintaining the essential services that are required to continue to function so that it is absolutely essential for grocery store workers to go to work and be available work for the rest of us to be able to follow uh, whether it's uh, supporting people who are in self-isolation or supporting a much more limited uh, um, uh, social engagement. And that's, that's, that's very important. So we need those essential services at work. Sometimes people make comparisons between jurisdictions. Just note that in California, for example, the, the, um, the industry sectors that have been excluded from, uh, uh, from what, what's sometimes called in California a lockdown 
represent about 65% of the GDP of California. So just to put it in context, we absolutely need uh, the food and the medicine and the other services that keep our society going and allow us to implement these extraordinary measures, these ex orders from Dr. Henry that change our society. And I, I think that continues to be an important thing to do. I think uh, we need to flatten the curve. You'll see, you, you know that, we know that. We're preparing for the circumstances that uh, uh, are before us, and that's why we've made these uh, historic, unprecedented changes in the acute care system as well. So uh, we're uh, uh, not just, uh, we've just not made extraordinary changes. We're preparing for the weeks that are to come uh, and the scenarios that are before us, and we're doing that in a vigorous way. But so much of it depends whether that is enough depends on every single person out there engaging 100% in what they need to do as individuals to make to stop the transmission of this virus in British Columbia. Thank you very much, and we're happy to take your questions.